Hello and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, Trump has directed NASA to put a man back on the moon and on Mars. Will Trump's search for the stars fuel another space race? I speak with renowned Chinese novelist Yan Gelin, whose novel You Touch Me will hit the cinemas this week under the title Jesus. We begin today's show with U.S. President Donald Trump to assert U.S. leadership in space exploration. Trump authorized acting NASA Administrator Robert Lightfoot Jr. to lead an innovative program to send American astronauts back to the moon and eventually to the Mars. But the feasibility of these goals are still subject to debate within the space community. Before we go to our panel, who are experts in the field, let's take a look at this background story. Back to the moon and eventually to the red planet. U.S. President Donald Trump has formally told NASA to refocus America's space program on lunar exploration and discovery. It marks an important step in returning American astronauts to the moon for the first time since 1972 for long-term ex exploration and use. The small step 45 years ago pointed to the route of future space exploration, but since that time, no human has ventured out beyond low Earth orbit. NASA doesn't even have its own space vehicle, having retired shuttles in 2011. This time may be a start. We will not only plant our flag and leave our footprint, we will establish a foundation for an eventual mission to Mars and perhaps someday to many worlds beyond. But for now, the question is whether the U.S. Congress will appropriate the funds needed to turn Trump's words into reality. Returning astronauts to the moon was the plan under former President George W. Bush, which called for building a moon base. Returning to the moon is an important step for our space program. But it failed without billions of dollars more in funding. That's why the Obama administration shifted the focus from the moon to a flexible path that would target new destinations to get astronauts farther out into deep space. I believe we can send humans to orbit Mars and return them safely to Earth. But the asteroid mission proved more difficult than expected. For many, space exploration has always been a dream. Just like Trump said on Monday, to lift our eyes all the way up to the heavens and once again imagine the possibilities waiting in those big, beautiful stars. We are dreaming big. Mr. Trump's plan to shoot for the moon land him among the stars anyway? Let's loop in our panelists with us in Beijing. Mr. Yang Yuguang, who is a professor at the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. Welcome back to our Good program. Evening. In The Hague, we have Giuseppe Ribaldi, who is the president of the Moon Village Association and also director of the Human Space Flight at the International Academy of astronautics. And in Columbus, United States, we invited John Horak, a professor and Neil Armstrong chair in aerospace policy at Ohio State University. Welcome back as well. Let me begin with you, Professor Horak. What does that mean? Once again, the moon mission reminded us of what happened in the Cold War. Is the U.S. really looking for a competition? In my opinion, the answer is no. This is a very different trip to the moon, a very different mode of going than we saw in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The president emphasized collaboration with other nations. He emphasized the role of commercial spaceflight. And while the first Apollo missions, the six landings that we had, were sort of a first test of how to get to the moon and how to get back safely, we learned a lot. But this will be a more permanent uh, opportunity for us to go to the moon with all people on Earth and to stay. 
Mm. But Mr. Ribaldi, we understand in the community of outer space in the U.S. there are a lot of debates about that. What do you make of this possibility? What's behind it? I think uh, the decision of uh, Mr. Trump uh, put right uh, the policy of the United States. The policy of, last policy of the United States was issued in 2010 under Obama, and it did not envisage the moon uh, as a first priority, but uh, it was mainly referring to Mars. So the policy just uh, uh, ratified by Trump uh, is putting the moon back uh, as a first priority for the United States and uh, for the rest of their allies. So I think that is a major political change which will help the United States and all the people working, cooperating with them, uh, focus on the activity related to a sustainable moon exploration. Mm. Mr. Yang here in Beijing, I did notice Mr. Ribaldi word, used a word called a political change. So what is it? Will this development be driven by political ego? Uh, how does China, which is planning its moon missions, think about this new policy possibility coming from the U.S.? Well, I should emphasize that we, China, develop the space technology depending on our, on our own needs. So it is, oh, we also always think that it, it is meaningless for us to compete with any, any other country, including the United States. Uh, but you see, uh, the final destination of the United States is to go to Mars. Uh, and uh, for other countries like Russia and China, because we have never been to the moon before, so go to the moon will be a very necessary step for us to go, even if we, in the future, we sooner or later want to go to the Mars, because we, we can test many tech technologies uh, during this procedure. And moreover, the moon is very important to the human being, and also it is very hopeful to be an outpost of human being and to have more resources utilized by human being to uh, get more deeper space into the solar system. So what you are saying is that you actually 100% understand why President Trump talking about going back to the moon? Is that what you're saying? That depends. Uh, I have emphasized before that it is reasonable for the Obama government to cancel the constellation program of the uh, George W. Bush government because, you know, that's the constellation program. Uh, the main goal is to return to the moon, but it uh, repeats the Apollo system. Mm -hmm. For the United States, because they have already been to the moon already, so it's, it's meaningless for them to repeat the Apollo program. All so right. I think this is reasonable. But for the future, if they can set up a, a permanent base on the lunar surface and uh, utilize the resources, it will be helpful for the final Mars mission. Is that in the blueprint, Mr. Horak? So I think the answer is yes. I have advocated for quite a while that I think the moon is an important stepping stone, testing ground, and place for us to prove out systems on our way to Mars. If Mars was a golf hole playing golf, I think it's too long to make it all the way in one swing. And so therefore, you, you do it in stages, you do it in steps, and the moon is a very, very good place for us to, to go together to build the technologies and the facilities and the know-how needed to go further on. But the question is, Mr. Rimbaudi, is it really about togetherness or is it really about competition? I think that is the core of the issue, isn't it? Uh, I don't think that uh, there is a competition. The issue is mainly related to tap new resources. The main difference has been said uh, earlier in the past was just prestige and political. Nowadays the considerations are economical. The moon is uh, one location where economy uh, can, be, uh, can be developed and therefore investment from private industry are going to be unleashed by going to the moon. In fact, the U.S. government is behind all, is behind all other uh, government, uh, and particularly private industry, mm. that they are already planning to go to the moon next year with the moon, um, Google X Prize. Yes, here's the thing, so Mr. Horak. So that is the main uh, difference. So yeah, okay, I got it. Mr. Horak, here's the thing. Your colleagues already talk about the money, the money issue. Secondly, how to streamline this relationship between NASA and some of the other commercial operations likely to also guiding the United States back again to the moon. Thirdly, what are some of the core barometers that's likely to measure the success or failure of the future mission? Fourthly, 
there's a thing that you also need to answer. That is, will this be politically in a way winning Trump uh, more, or actually it is going to get a lot of oppositions in political field? Professor Horak, I know a lot of questions, but these are all important ones. Well, I, think that's a, I think that's a very comprehensive question. Let me do my very best. Go ahead, sir. First of all, you mentioned competition, and in the United States, competition, competition forms uh, in, around economy, around ideas, around innovation, around disruption. And so I think when we talk about competition, we're not talking about a competition between nations for demonstration of power. Mm but a competition of ideas, a competition of, of business models. That, right. So there will be that kind of competition uh, in the United States, Western Europe, we thrive on that. Secondly, you asked about uh, resources. Uh, I agree with my colleague from, from Europe that this is about resources, it's about getting new resources, it's about how do we find uh, new materials, how? new ways to make, make uh, positive impacts and impact the quality of life. And from a political perspective, Space is an Im extremely important area for us to collaborate because it's a place where we, we figure it out rather than fight it out. Mm -hmm. And this is incredibly important for the future of everyone on the earth, that we, that we compete in the marketplace of ideas and not in the marketplace of destruction, that All we right. compete in the marketplace of progress and well-being and not, in, not in, uh, in competitive ways that are destructive for people on Earth. That certainly is the ideals that the space community has been upholding from your perspective. But one of the crucial issues, uh, Professor Horak, is the relationship between the government operations and also the private and the business operations about the Mars, uh, about rather the moons right now. Uh, what is it likely to be that uh, relationship? What is going to be the one that the government funding responsible? And how will the uh, commercial uh, operations develop? How will they interact with one another? Will that be competition or rather cooperation? We don't know. Professor Horak, do we know? Well, we, yeah, we, we, are, we are actually running that experiment in the United States right now. NASA is changing. It is evolving. You can see the United States' reliance on commercial uh, enterprise yeah. to resupply the space station. Uh, coming soon, within the next 18 months, we will have commercial companies launching astronauts into space. And so where in, in history NASA has been the customer, if you will, uh, and creating the, the demand to go to the moon or to go to Mars or to go to Jupiter or Saturn. You're seeing space agencies around the world. I was mm. with Jan Werner, the head of, of ESA, last week. And we talked a lot about the emerging role. Space agencies will become facilitators, innovators, integrators, and not necessarily customers. Yes, there will be a customer uh, dimension. But we're actually working very well in the United States with SpaceX and Blue Origin right. and Sierra Nevada and other private companies to help them grow, grow space. And the relationship with NASA is very strong. All right. Mr. Yang, while the United States is trying to work out about that relationship, what about for China? At this point, what is the biggest obstacles for China to fulfill its dream of going to the moon, which has always been in China's legends anyway? Well, you know that China is not, per is not performing its uh, uh, space station program, so the, this program will last for about 10 years. And so, uh, uh, although it has not, been, uh, approved by, uh, not uh, been approved by the government, uh, central government yet, but the uh, aerospace industry and also the uh, China National Space uh, Organization has also already expressed the wish to uh, perform the human uh, missions to the moon. Uh, so, uh, in the future, we will already have some preliminary studies and also uh, performing some key technology studies for the future potential uh, uh, lunar, mi lunar man missions. Then I need to follow up with a question to you, Mr. Yang. What do you think? Will there be really cooperation between the Chinese side and the United States side? Well, uh, actually speaking, yes, uh, the United St the cooperation between China and the U.S. is really difficult, but it's all on the uh, U.S. side because we China has expressed many times that we are willing to cooperate with uh, ma uh, any other countries, including the United States. Right. And also, we have already have examples on our future space station program because we already signed some agreements with the European side and other countries, uh, and also with UN to perform some uh, joint experiment on board the China space station. So, in the future. 
uh, in the potential lunar manned mission, I think the change, uh, it will not change. Besides, also during the uh, robotic lunar missions uh, in the next several years, we also uh -huh. have payloads from the European side and other countries. But that's with the European side. Uh, Mr. Ribaldi, do you think a real cooperation could happen between China and the United States if we're all talking about a common goal, going to the moon? In fact, uh, the Moon Village Association, which we created, has exactly that goal. The United States and China, they have a problem related to the law. As you know, the Senate of the United States forbid, for the time being, with the present administration, uh, direct cooperation between the United States and China. And so I think we need uh, to avoid the creation of separate program like space station, the ISS, the Chinese space station. We really have to put all those programs together, and that is the vision of the Moon Village. That is basically all the party stakeholder, industry, government, in the university, uh, public that is interested in the Moon, put under the same umbrella for the benefit of mankind. Moon Village is the answer to all of this. Everybody <laughs> will be part. There will be a, a component, a Chinese component, an American component, all right. but all on the same heading, the Moon Village. Well, you've been doing a lot of advertisement for your association, but that certainly is an ideal you are pursuing. Good for you, though no. in reality, it is getting complicated. Uh, Professor Horak, therefore, go to you. You talk about those ideals, sir. You talk about your common dream with your colleagues from all over the world, including from China. But that's within the space community. We are not talking about politics yet. When it gets to the politics, becoming ever more complicated. United States and the former Soviet Union, during the Cold War era, one of the biggest competition going on between these two countries, war in the outer space, specifically on the moon and many worry these days with all these political intensity going on and the debates will that be repeated for the future what can space community do in this regard I think that you have you have put your finger on the issue and that is that the challenges we have are political uh, Professor Yang, who sits next to you there in the studio, is a dear friend of mine. We work together across the United States and China in scientific collaborations extremely well. We're economically so tied together that, that we can't uh, do without each other. And if our governments are truly the representatives of the people, uh, they follow the lead of, of those who put them in office. I also am reminded that, uh, yes, the Cold War was not a time when uh, the United States and Russia were friendly. Um, but today, we depend on each other. Mm. In the lifetime of my grandfather, the United States and Japan were at war. The United States and Germany were at war. And today, these are some of our most trusted and, and valued partners on the planet. So these things not only can happen, they do happen. And I believe that the space community can be an important factor in making sure that they must happen. Mm. Here's the thing, Mr. Young. Beside that political issue, another issue also lingering, which is with the recent goal of the United States of going back to the moon, is it an indication that we've been going so fast in our space exploration and the development? We need to slow down to absorb more of what we already had, or actually we should be going further and further to the outer space to explore even into the more unknown areas and space. Mr. Yang, what is your thinking about this? Uh, well, that con uh, this question concerns with the returns of the uh, space pro program, even the uh, human space program, or those for the deeper space uh, exploration. Actually speaking, most of the returns come from the indirect ones. As I uh, read some example before, uh, because some, uh, you can seldom see the direct returns from mm. the manned space program or uh, deep space uh, exploration, either a manned or robotic ones. But, you know, that's the return rate of the, uh, space, the this kind of space program are very high according to the analysis of very uh, many uh, research institutes. So uh, it is very necessary for China to have this kind of program, although uh, maybe we, can wait, uh, we should wait for many years for, to see the returns from these programs for the okay. whole society. But we can see that the uh, economic prosper of the United States in the 1990s, uh, there are experts think that this, uh, the, there are also uh, contributions from mm. the Apollo program. So you can see uh, the, the booming of uh, economic growth in the uh, internet era is also have some relationship with okay. the lunar programs. 
In the issue of outer space exploration, Mr. Ribaldi, are we going too fast? Should we slow down? Or actually, we're at the right speed? I think uh, the speed uh, is related by the sustainability. That is the key. So uh, exploration uh, uh, cannot follow political uh, lead, certainly not these days. So the, the path uh, is to follow the economics. So in order to follow the economics, you need sustainability. So uh, we have uh, now reached uh, a lower orbit has been saturated by government program. They will be following up by industrial uh, program, which will have their own private uh, industrial space station. And then the next logical step, again, sustainable, is the moon. And so it will go after that. So as long as something becomes sustainable and therefore economic, there we are going to go. Exploration for the sake of science is, of course, a fundamental. And this will be staying uh, with all the government. But there is only a certain amount of money which will be dedicated uh, to the exploration per se. Mm. The rest, uh, it has to be sustainable, and that is explain why the, the moon is the next step. Mm. We only have very limited time left, the gentlemen, but my final question for all of you is, we've seen a booming of uh, technological advancements over the past few years. You know, with robotics, with artificial intelligence, people are going into the study of human beings' minds in order to find out what is going to be the future and direction of our development. And at the same time, we still have the outer space exploration. How are we going to see these different directions of development, of experiments, of scientific explorations? Uh, which is likely to be the future trend? Let's go to you, Professor Horak. I think the answer to that question uh, is related to what Professor Yang said. The world we live in today is a result of the investments made in science, technology, and in my opinion, in particular, space exploration uh, in the past, whether it's GPS, whether it's the satellite technology that we're using to communicate now, whether it's the materials in my automobile. These are things that have come out of and enriched, not only enriched the life that we have, but have almost defined the way we live. And so the future that our children will inherit is going to be a function of what we do now. Mm. And therefore, I think this investment in going to the moon, in sustainability, and in the competition of ideas and, right. and commercial ideas and business, it's going to be what defines the future for our children. Mr. Ribaldi, very briefly from you, too. I think the future is also a combination between artificial intelligence uh, and human intelligence. Uh, in order to explore, uh, you will require a lot also of autonomous tasks and these autonomous tasks will have substantially mm -hmm. technology on the earth, as has been said. Exploration is going to develop a new technology which we're going to use for the benefit on earth. All right, Mr. Young, briefly. Well, uh, for this topic, I should emphasize that the, uh, the direction in the space exploration will be very important for the development of human beings. If we can invest more on this field, we can have uh, the uh, um, even, uh, even better and faster right, development of the whole human society. Yang Yuguang, Giuseppe Ribaldi, and John Horak, thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. All the best, whether to the moon or to the Mars. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei, still to come on our program. I speak with renowned Chinese novelist Yang Geling, whose novel, You Touch Me, will keep the cinemas this week under the title. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. The world is changing fast. Those dramatic changes have given writers enormous amounts of inspiration and food for thought. Yang Geling is one of them. As one of the most acclaimed contemporary writers from China, she writes in both Chinese and English and has produced some of the most popular titles both in China and beyond. Many of her works have also been adapted into movies, but to her it is crucial to write things that previously would not have been possible, specifically documenting the intensity of 
and real life drama in China. Upon hearing the news that her latest novel, You Touched Me, will be brought to the big screen in China with the name Youth, I spoke with Yang Geling in her Beijing home. She recounted how a stubborn writer like her came into being, starting from the Cultural Revolution, when she struggled to find any reading material. Coming from an intellectual family, she said one of the most difficult things to do at that time was hiding books so that they would not be confiscated. My uh, grandmother had uh, had them behind uh, just a layer of uh, newspaper. The Red Guard came to put the you know uh, cross uh, uh, on the on the bookshelves, so then we can always lift those. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Grandma, very smart. <laughs> yes, yes. Which one you like the best? Dang Wang. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was uh, and. Uh, a lot of youth and, and adventures and uh, uh, love stories. It's hard to imagine someone like you who have read through that whole bookshelf <laughs> of yeah. novels which were a taboo at the time and later joined the performance troupe. Yeah. How did you mingle with your peers? Uh, actually, I had a trouble ming mingling in with that group. Uh, it, 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 on the surface, I was okay. You know, I was one of the kids. But uh, inside, uh, I, I I thought something was wrong. You know, something was wrong with, uh, um, you know, the, the the atmosphere I was born to and uh, I was uh, grown, uh, raised up in, you know, with the music, uh, opera and all that. You know, but, and also those, uh, those kids are suspicious of me too. And How because I, when I talk, I, I said something very caustic and uh, sometimes I thought it was uh, funny, but it was uh, kind of, uh, uh, to them, it was painfully caustic. I thought I was joking, yeah, but uh, that sometimes they think, you know, your imagination went too far. Mm. So you were an outlier in a way, yes. among all your peers at the time. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, uh, fell in love with uh, an officer too early, and I wrote a lot of uh, love letters and love uh, po uh, poems, uh, and uh, and the writing began from there, <laughs> 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 which is a very good way to start. <laughs> Yes, yes. So then yeah. I uh, I got the criticism of uh, the whole uh, performing troupe. Then I learned how to hide my thoughts. Yeah. How did you? <laughs> and I Tell tried me some tricks. <laughs> yes, I tried to uh, uh, to hide my diary, my writings, and I tried to write something that is not true. What I really thought uh, in my diary, I knew somebody was going to uh, somebody was going to you know read it. So I uh, I uh, tried to write the diary that I like I was going to publish them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> publish them at that time. <laughs> <laughs> at the age of 12, Yang Geling became a dancer and joined the Chinese military performing troupe. Her dance career spanned 13 years. During the latter part of it, she volunteered for the front line when the Sino-Vietnamese border conflict broke out. There she became a journalist, trying to write down what she saw and made sense of everything that happened around her. And you volunteered to go to the frontiers in which there was a war going on between China and Vietnam. Yeah, right. I just turned 20, mm -hmm. you know. I was, uh, I turned 20 at, uh, uh, in, uh, in January and the war broke up in, in March, mm -hmm. so. I was uh, sent to the field, uh, field hospital mm -hmm. uh, to uh, interview those uh, wounded soldiers. There are really uh, lots of them. The one night there were uh, uh, more than 1,000 soldiers were sent to this uh, uh, field Just hospital. over one night? Yeah, over one night. So. What was that like for you? I mean, in the middle of the night, all of these bodies yeah. injured mm -hmm. coming in all at the same time. For someone who been in a dance troupe, performance troupe, I guess it's a very different world. Yeah, the overnight it changed my world of uh, heroism or great ideals because the, you see all these heroes who are so 
much in pain and uh, um, the, you know their mangled body and they, they, their, um, uh, they, they, their body parts missing you know and I, what I remember is that to this day is the smell of blood you know it, it's oh, a, it? yeah it's like a cloud it's like a, you know it's, it's a very distinctive uh, smell you know it because Sick. it's yeah thick and, and uh, so many bodies are all you know in the corridors and you know because there were so not so many beds forever I remember that uh, the, the smell that the smell of uh, of uh, pain and of death you know did you talk to them yeah yes of course yes who did you talk to oh uh, I talked to too many soldiers many Is there any young one soldiers that you still remember today Yes, yes, I remember one soldier uh, who was uh, 20, I think, my age. Uh, mm, he had, the, you know, the genital uh, blown away, and so he was uh, uh, trying to com com uh, commit suicide. And so the, the head of uh, uh, that department uh, asked me to talk to him, to cheer him up. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't know what to say, you know, because uh, he was... Uh, uh, adopted by his uh, actually uh, 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 bride to be, you know, the future brides of family. I so see. he was uh, uh, um, often, not often, right? So uh, and if he was uh, couldn't, uh, you know, uh, fulfill his uh, duty as a uh, uh, son-in-law, he he couldn't uh, pay, repay the, you know, the. the the love and everything, the uh, uh, raising the up of the family, him. yeah, give him. Mm -hmm. So he thought uh, he 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 w w would rather die, and uh, so I. Uh, what did you say to him? I. I don't know. <laughs> I was. I I couldn't think of anything. He was very very quiet, and uh, you know, he 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 didn't want to talk, mm -hmm. and uh, so. And, but when the doctor came to check him, and uh, some you know uh, something you know tickled him, he he giggled. Mm -hmm. Then I thought, oh, well, he probably was okay, so I left. And after I left the hospital, I returned to Chengdu, and then somebody told me he really did because he killed himself. Did you regret that? I think he made uh, up his mind, no matter you know. Uh, uh, mm, what uh, he appeared. So what is hero? You know, what is hero to you? Or does hero or heroism still matter? Mm, I think uh, he heroism still matters to me because uh, it, 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 it is important in, uh, even in everyday life. You know, you, if you're uh, we, we, if it's a weak against uh, uh, strong, and if you, uh, 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 individual life against the big mob, you know, mm -hmm. and if you try to protect who is weaker than you, I think these are all heroism for me. Mm -hmm. What is the thing that you've learned from a war? What is war to you, and is it worthwhile uh -huh. for the youth to be spending their time in the war. Upon reflection, because many of the people today have never been through wars, mm -hmm. even though there were a lot of talk about wars in the media, what is war? Oh, uh, well, I then afterwards I turned uh, into a, a forever a, a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. You know, I tried to, um, to join all the um, peace demonstrations in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, an, any time there is a war, and we, we heard that the war was going to happen, or we, we, uh, I tried my best to, to, to stop it. I know it's, uh, it's uh, futile, you mm -hmm. know, it's no, no use. But uh, then I could uh, uh, make peace with myself. Mm. Her days on the front line changed her perceptions of life and death, war, and peace. Yang Geling told me that it is the sole reason why she later wrote the novel, You Touch Me. The novel deals with a teenage performance group in the PLA during the Cultural Revolution, their lives and struggles, and their experience of war during the Sino-Vietnam border conflict.
Now it is being adapted into a movie titled Youth, directed by Feng Xiaogang, another household name in China. Despite some ups and downs, the movie is finally hitting Chinese cinemas this week. You are trying in this novel, speaking with different voices, as an author, hmm. but at the same time as a young dancer. The author in the book was trying, quote unquote, in a way, talking to this young dancer. So how would you be able to jump back and forth between the used to be you and the current you? Was it painful? Um, or was it fun? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, the, the author in the novel actually is also a, a, a fictitious uh, person uh, because uh, uh, I think I can tell uh, truth better uh, hiding behind my characters. I have more courage because then I don't have this self-censorship. You know, so if, what if uh, people hold me responsible for what I said, you know, as a girling or mm. as a young girling who said such and such, then they will probably I'll have to be responsible for all these uh, remarks. Mm -hmm. But uh, as an art author who could be me or could be somebody else, you know, people can't really tell, mm. then I'll be much more courageous and much more uh, truthful. So uh, actually people can find more truth, you know, which is uh, uh, some theory or some philosophy or mm. some uh, r uh, what I really think in my novels than in my essays. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I'm very smart. <laughs> very smart. I yeah. guess it did succeed, isn't it? What is it like for you to be able to write this novel? Youth. Youth. Just youth. Well, um, uh, youth is uh, such uh, um, uh, abundant life. You know, you, you you never think you could die. You know, it was a long way of. Uh, ahead of you so you it's like it's you know, forever you, yeah you can't afford to make a, a wrong move so you can't afford to waste your love your emotions mm -hmm. you can't afford to be stupid you know just so, embrace everything right right you try everything if it's a mistake well sorry you know that uh, I still have time to make up right so uh, that's uh, you you learn you know you learn by making mistakes mm. so it's all allowed and then people will forgive you and you forgive yourself too but nowadays if I make a mistake I might never forgive myself That's Yang Geling, one of the biggest names in contemporary Chinese literature. Through her story, one would develop a sense of how contemporary history has shaped writers from China, at least a maverick like her. And with that, we are coming to the end of today's program. If you'd like to see more, please find us, World Inside CGTN, into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sino Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone at the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Have a great weekend.